Time now for my royal masterminds, Lady Colin Campbell and Phil Dampier. And it was the story that rocked not just the nation, but the world. 26 years ago today, in the early hours of the morning, news began to break that would change the monarchy forever. Buckingham Palace has confirmed the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. The princess died following a car crash in Paris. A statement from Buckingham Palace said the Queen and the Prince of Wales were deeply shocked and distressed by this terrible news. Uh, we don't know uh, who they talked to to put this on the Reuters news agency wire. It says Princess Diana has died. And that her partner, Dodi Fired, has also been killed. They were apparently being pursued by paparazzi on two motorcycles. She died at 4 a.m. after going into cardiac arrest. That, according to doctors at the hospital in Paris, Diana, Princess of Wales, is dead. Now, times and monarchs have since changed, but despite Diana's infamous reluctance to see Charles ascend the throne, he is now our king and her arch nemesis, Camilla, our queen. But her eldest son, William, also plays a crucial role in our modernised monarchy, which would undoubtedly make the late princess immeasurably proud. So what is Princess Diana's legacy and how has it shaped the royal family of today? Well, I'm honoured to be joined tonight by my royal masterminds, Lady Colin Campbell, a respected royal insider who was the first to predict the Wales' separation and divorce in her 1992 international, very controversial bestseller, Diana in private. Alongside her is the author and journalist Phil Dampier, who spent six years following Diana around the world as royal reporter for The Sun and was there in person to witness the iconic handshake between the princess and an AIDS patient that changed the stigma around the disease forever. So look, Phil, uh, the legacy of Diana is, of course, immense. I mean, the fact that we're even talking about this event 26 years on and I'm sure for you it still feels as real and shocking as it does for me, shows that she made a huge impact. But did she really change the monarchy in the way that she hoped to? Yeah, good evening, Dan. Sometimes seems like yesterday, doesn't it? Looking at those clips, it's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? 26 years ago, you've got people who have got uh, kids of school age wandering around who weren't even born when it happened. So it's just quite incredible to see that. But uh, I think she changed the monarchy before she came along. Uh, you know, for example, Princess Anne, she president and save the children fund she'd be in Africa. She would never think about picking up a, a baby, a child in, in, in a camp in Africa. Diana really changed all that. She made it much more touchy-feely, and I think we see that today, certainly with her sons. You talk about legacy. I always used to say her legacy was her sons. Of course, unfortunately, with the events of the last five years with Harry, that's rather changed a little bit. Uh, it, I mean, it does make you wonder if she was still alive today. The situation would probably be totally different. She'd be 62. I'm sure she wouldn't have allowed the situation to get out of hand where the two brothers fell out. But uh, at least you know, we know that William, I think the monarch is safe in his hands. And she always wanted William to succeed and the monarchy to succeed. So in that sense, her legacy is secure. Lady Colin Campbell, you had an interesting relationship with Diana. I believe you first met her when she was a teenager. But of course, your book was true, but also quite critical in parts. Uh, what do you make of her legacy now? Well, I actually agree with Phil. I think her legacy is her children, but I think her legacy is both her children. I think that her, Diana was a very contradictory personality, and Diana could be a very divisive personality. She had many, many virtues, but Diana was very damaged. She was damaged by the way she was brought up as a child by her parents' divorce. She, she got a ringside seat on what treachery and ambition was all about from her grandmother, Ruth Lady Fomoy, who testified against her daughter so that the Spencer children would remain with their father and remain in the royal fold instead of going to Australia with Francis and Peter Shankir. I mean, you know, she and she from a very early age saw not only the brilliance of, of splendor and privilege, but it's on the belly. It's a very unattractive on the belly. And 
she, I think she was very much a monarchist, and she certainly wanted William to become king, and he will doubtless become king. And he is the best of Diana. But Harry, I hate to say, is the worst of Diana. Mm. And Diana was both those people. Yeah, sort of the two sides of her personality. It's incredible, Phil, though, looking at those pictures of Diana because she was a celebrity unlike any other. There was something magnetic about her. And even now, she she really is one of those iconic figures. Now, you obviously covered her up close and personal. What was she like as a person and what was she like when the cameras were off? She was, she was great fun. She used to talk to us all the time. She was always having a bit of banter with the press. It normally revolved around clothes, I remember. She was obsessed with clothes. She'd always come up to you and say, why are you wearing that tie? Is that for a bet? Or, you know, don't like your shoes? Or, you know, <laughs> dress for the occasion or something like that. She was always joking about it. And I always remember, of course, one day I was standing there with Andrew Morton, who at the time was on one of the tabloids, and he kept saying, she keeps looking at me, she keeps looking me up and down, I think she likes me. And of course, I mean, saying, Andrew, shut up, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. And of course, a couple of years later, there he was writing Diana, her true story. But I have to say that Lady C was very much ahead of the game. She never really got credit for her book, which was way ahead of Morton's, way ahead of everyone else. Uh, about well, indeed. Practice. Indeed. And, and Lady C, I'm interested in, in uh, the origin story of that book, because is it true that at one point uh, you were hoping to write the authorised version of Diana's story in the, in the way that Andrew Morton eventually did? Well, uh, yes and no, because Andrew didn't actually write her authorised biography. She wrote her covertly authorised biography. My book started out as a fundraiser for three of her charities that were going to be three of my charities. And I went into Buckingham Palace after Dan and I spoke about it. I saw Dickie Arbiter uh, and it was going to proceed as an anodyne biography focusing on her charity work. And then once we started working on it, Diana decided at some point to change direct, change horses in midstream. Up until that point, Charles was fine. The marriage hadn't worked because they were totally incompatible. He allowed her to have her lover. He was a really great guy. And then overnight it changed and she was playing the victim card. And I came to the conclusion that she had been most likely speaking to friends of hers who said to her, you know, Diana, it's not really going to play very well with factory workers in Dagenham if you say you have to get out of this horrid royal way of life because you are being restricted. You need to come up with something more sympathetic. So she came up with a victim card. And at that point, I pulled out because I was, I actually thought it was outrageous that she could expect me, having told me X, she was going to expect me to write Y. And I just wouldn't do it. And I thought it was outrageous. And I still think it was outrageous. And I also think she didn't have to do it. You know, she could have left and she could have left rather more cleanly and nicely than she did leave. But... Mm. The, but it's all history. It's all, it yeah. all happened. It is. And, but she, may I say, can I say, yes, she please. lived to regret it. She lived to regret it. Because by the time she died, she understood that she had played some really wrong cards. And by the time she died, she was ostracized throughout the establishment. And she had only, in the last few months before her death, started to retrieve any sort of respectable position within the establishment. So she learned her lesson. Yes, and of course, uh, Prince William would cast a lot of the blame for that situation at the door of Martin Bashir and the BBC. But that is a whole other conversation. But absolutely fascinating insights from uh, two journalists who knew Princess Diana in very different ways. Lady Colin Campbell and Phil Dampier, thank you so much. We'll speak on Monday.